Let me read Isaiah 11, and Keith, our brother, will come uh, and share with us some God's word. So we're looking at uh, Born to Change Your World, I think is our theme. Isaiah 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash, the sash around his waist. The wolf will lie with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw with the, like the ox. The infant will play near the hall of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So I'll proceed. And as Pastor reminded us, uh, this morning is the second in Advent, so we continue our series uh, during this time of Advent where we look forward to Christmas, where we want to celebrate the message of Christmas, that Jesus was sent to this earth as a savior to bring new hope to all of its people. And our theme, as uh, uh, the pastor reminded us, was that Jesus was born to change the world. He came in the form of a child with a mission to transform the lives of all men and women everywhere. The coming of the Savior is what we celebrate at Christmas time. The Advent season has begun. The countdown to Christmas is on. It's just a few weeks away now. It's a time of celebration, a time to remind ourselves of the hope and the victory that Jesus brings to each one of us. And just like in the time of ancient Israel, when, is, when Isaiah wrote the words of the passage that we read this morning, just like in those ancient times, People today also are searching for some hope. We've already thought about and prayed this morning about this new COVID situation that's giving some people fear and is giving a lot of concern. People are hoping that the future is going to be better than these past couple of years that we've endured. People are longing to hear that better times are coming soon. This December marks two years since we've been suffering the pandemic, and everybody wants to know, when will it all end? Just as we thought that things were slowly returning to normal, this new variant comes along, and many people are fearing that the whole cycle is about to start all over again. Right now, everybody wants COVID to be over and what we used to call normal life to resume. And as we prayed this morning, perhaps we're looking to the government or to world leaders or our health experts, scientists, to lead us out of this situation that we're all very weary of now. The nation of Judah in Isaiah's time, 
was looking for a Messiah. They were also faced with difficult circumstances, desperate circumstances, in fact, perhaps more serious than anything any of us have ever known. Last week, Ellen spoke to us and gave us something of the historical circumstances at the time of Isaiah. Their king had rejected a clear instruction from God. God had given them promises, but instead they went the other way. They formed uh, political and military alliances with the Assyrian nation, and the whole thing went wrong. It backfired. And now they were facing destruction. It was going to be either death or deportation for them. It was only a matter of time. When we are desperate, our human instinct is to reach out for something that transcends the limits of what we ourselves can do. We're looking for an escape, a kind of deliverance, a way out. Our cries are expressed in our prayers or in the deepest longings of our hearts. And we might be saying, is there anybody out there who cares? Will somebody come to the rescue? Turn the tables, get us out of this situation. That was the mood of the people in 700 BC, Judah, when, his, when Isaiah wrote. And to some extent, it's the mood of our world today as well. And Isaiah's prophetic message gives us the final answer to those longings. God will send a messianic king, Isaiah declared with authority of the Holy Spirit. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Though he appears human, his true nature is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. His mission is to heal the scars and the wounds of our broken hearts, to release prisoners who are in prisons of their own making, and to restore what has been lost in the wasted years when we didn't know him. All this we now know was fulfilled by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in Isaiah chapter 11, the prophet takes us even further. He takes us past the earthly ministry, the life and death and the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. And he also gives us a vision of the future beyond COVID, beyond our own generation, beyond the times we live in today. He shows us a day in the future when this same Messiah, who came 2,000 years ago, will reign over the whole earth. In Isaiah chapter 11, the prophet gives us a glimpse of what it'll be like when his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Why does the Holy Spirit, who inspired Isaiah with these visions of the future, want us to see this? Well, I think, given the circumstances, I think the answer is pretty obvious. We need hope as well. We need to understand what kind of king we're going to find in the manger of Bethlehem. At this Christmas time, we ourselves and the whole world needs to know what we can expect from this infant king named Jesus. So then, looking into the passage, what does Isaiah tell us the birth of Jesus is going to be like? And his opening sentences describe the earthly roots of Jesus. And as we read, then a shoot will, will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. A stump is all that is left of a tree when it's cut down. 
Now then, an olive tree, which is common in Israel, is very difficult to kill. They say that if you cut it down and burn it right down to the ground, in time, a new shoot will begin to appear from the earth below. And uh, we have an illustration photo uh, that we took on the uh, uh, walk yesterday. Uh, these were some uh, uh, trees that uh, we came across when we were appreciating nature on our well-being walk. It's perhaps not exactly what uh, the prophet Isaiah had in mind when he wrote those words, but these trees have an unusual shape. It looks like they've either been cut down or felled or suffered some kind of accident in the past, and then new life has grown up out of the stumps that were left there before. And it's, it's a, a kind of illustration, really, of the fact that when a tree is cut down or when nature is cut down, it'll grow back. And when we look at uh, Israel's history, we can see how many times that nation, the people of God, have been cut down, but they have come back. They have grown back. They have been revived. But picture this scene then in your minds, that... Israel is just like a clear-cut field of burnt-out stumps. But God is going to be faithful to his promises in regard to his people. Out of all this death and desolation, a small green shoot will spring forth and bring with it the promise of a glorious hope for the future. From one of the dead stumps, from the family tree of Jesse will come the Messiah. We remember that Jesse was the father of Israel's greatest king, King David. And though his royal lineage holds incredible importance to the people of Israel, Isaiah in this passage doesn't specifically name King David here. Why do you think the prophet chooses not to mention King David? Instead, he refers to Jesse, who was an ordinary, <coughs> humble man. Well, one answer might be this. The Apostle Paul tells us that God has chosen what is foolish, what is insignificant, God has cho chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen those things that are insignificant and despised and viewed as nothing to bring them to something so that nobody can boast in his presence. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, 27 to 29. We in our modern times, tend to value beauty and strength and influence and wealth. All these things which we think are important, but God brings his savor into the world in the most unpretentious and the most unpredictable of ways. Remember, nobody expected King David to came where, come from where he came from, from a humble family. Nobody expected the Messiah to be born in such humble circumstances. And God gives us hope because he can give us salvation at times when we least expect it and from sources that we least ex expect it from. God gives us hope. Jesus was not born into privilege. Jesse was never a king. And being born into the line of Jesse didn't mean that the Messiah was born into a royal family as a crown prince and grew up as part of the ruling class. Jesus did not start out as royalty. Instead, as we know, he's going to inherit his kingdom. Jesse lived in Bethlehem and was visited by the prophet Samuel. 
to anoint his youngest son, David, as king. That's important to note, isn't it, that uh, David was Jesse's youngest son. Normally, the tradition would be that the eldest son would be appointed king. But David was the youngest son, so again, God surprises us in the way he does things, the unexpected. King David was appointed to be king. And then 40 generations later, an angel came to visit Mary and to announce to her that she would have the son of the God Most High, that God would make him king like David, and that his kingdom will have no end. In Revelation 22, 16, when Jesus announces his second coming to John, the apostle, he introduces himself saying this, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Jesus is the same who was, who is, and who is to come. Jesus was legally the son of Joseph, who was David's descendant, legal de uh, descendant. And he was also a descendant of David by blood as well, because Mary was also a descendant of David. She was from the same family. Romans 1.3 tells us that Jesus was of the lineage of David according to the flesh. So then Jesus is identified with the right to reign by legal right and by blood fulfilling the prophecy, fulfilling the uh, promise of salvation. And he won't just be the offspring of David. He will be more than equal to the King, King David. And as we explore this passage, we see that the, this baby born in Bethlehem will rise to do what no one else has done. So moving, then on, the, moving on in the passage then, what does Isaiah tell us that Jesus would be like? Well, let me ask, based on what characteristics do we consider a person important? Physical appearance, possessions, popularity, etc. In the time of uh, Jesus, cameras didn't exist. So we don't have a record of his physical appearances. But it is important to note how he was described by the prophet Isaiah. The son of God, our savior. And then Isaiah emphasizes the Holy Spirit in him. He says to us, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and power the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. So then, the spirit of the Lord is described in the life of Jesus. Jesus did not shine for having important earthly positions. His powerful ministry was based on communion with his Father. He taught by example, always serving, always serving people. Sometimes he was physically tired, from spending all day walking with his disciples, preaching salvation and healing in the villages. He mentions that he didn't even have a stone to lay his head on. But his mind, his soul, his body, his time was occupied in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He was always motivated by the Holy Spirit throughout his earthly ministry. His motivation and his guidance was to please the Father, to fulfill his mission. And so he got up and he prayed every day to seek the presence of his Father. Every day he prayed in the Spirit who guided him to the good works that pleased his Father in heaven. And what kind of authority did he have? He was like a full cup, completely overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And the presence of the Spirit was in him and was evidenced by his wisdom, intelligence, advice, and power. He lived filled with the Holy Spirit. 
perhaps it's interesting to remind ourselves what we usually ask God for in our prayers. Do we ask him for material things? Do we ask him to grant us a personal favor or to achieve something? That's all right because God knows us perfectly. Even our motivations can't deceive him. But what do you think would happen if we asked him for more wisdom from above before ma making decisions, before acting? What if we ask him to guide us in doing his will, seeking first his kingdom, his justice, just as Jesus did with the Reverend Orr? The Bible tells us that if we lack wisdom, we should ask God for it. Fear of God means fully submitting to him. Jesus never acted alone without first consulting with the Father. Do we consult the Father in every decision that we make? Or are we quick to act from our own wisdom? The Bible says that there are things that seem good to man, but in reality, they lead us to the path of destruction. In verse 3 of Isaiah, the prophet says that the Spirit will make him, Jesus, understand diligently in the fear of the, law, the Lord. He will not judge according to the sight of men, nor react by what his ears hear. Jesus had a ministry in tune with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we would hope that we always make wise decisions guided by God. The Bible tells us about the constant struggle between the flesh and the spirit that all believers have. It is not what enters, but what comes out of our mouths that contaminates, Jesus tells us. If anyone comes to me, he must dis deny himself and follow me. From what we, are, we feed our hearts, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let's remember to act wisely. Let's not be quick to judge others. Let's follow God's wisdom tinged with love and mercy. Because the Bible tells us that in the same way that we judge, we also will be judged. James chapter 3, 13 to 18 says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by good conduct his works in wise meekness. But if you have bitter jealousy and contention in your hearts, do not boast or lie against the truth. Because this kind of wisdom is not that which comes down from high, but is earthly and unspiritual. For where there is jealousy and contention, there is disturbance and every de uh, evil deed. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then it is peaceful, kind, benign, full of mercy, good fruits, without uncertainty and hypocrisy. So then, I think that's a, a good reminder to us that when we are asked to act according to God's will, to be beware of our own agendas and our own motivations. And then, moving on, what does Isaiah tell us that the rule and the justice of Jesus will be like? Jesus speaks about the poor and the meek. Who are the poor and the meek, according to the Bible? They are those who recognize their need of God. According to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And in the Bible, the meek doesn't mean being fragile or weak, but it means those with self-control, those who put their total trust in God. They don't act in a reactive way, but with meekness. They don't fight against the will of God. 
Rather, they're waiting to learn from Jesus. Meekness shows us the character of Christ. Meekness can only be learned from Jesus. Jesus says to us in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Isaiah tells us that Jesus will judge with justice for the poor. Who are the poor? The meek of the earth those who recognize themselves as ruined without the presence of God in their lives. Matthew 5 again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom. According to the text in Isaiah, Jesus will fight in favor of the poor. And conversely, it also tells us that he will strike with the rod of his mouth and with the spirit of his lips He will kill the wicked. The wicked are those who lack faith in God and act against God's will with self-sufficiency. They are those who disobey or despise God. They murmur and criticize. They are selfish. They boast and flatter themselves and follow the evil desires of their heart. When Jesus comes a second time, he will judge with the sword of his of his mouth, which is like a two-edged sword, and the wicked will be destroyed. But God tells us, stand firm, girding your loins with the truth, and clothed clothed with the breastplate of justice. This, then, is the invitation for all believers to be clothed with the armor of God, the Holy Spirit, the word of the Lord. Each one of us has their own story, how God came to save us, and change our lives for eternity, to learn from him, to be humble and meek. And Isaiah says that in Jesus, righteousness will be the girdle of his loins and, the faith, and faithfulness the girdle of his waist. And as we've reminded ourselves this morning in the songs that we've sung, Jesus is going to rule in perfect justice. And then the final part of the chapter, where Isaiah gives us a a picture of a perfect creation, telling us what the eternal kingdom of God is going to be like. And we read, didn't we, in those final verses that the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard with the kid will lie down. The calf and the lion and the domestic beast will walk together and a child is going to herd them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion is going to eat straw like the ox and the suckling child will play over the viper's cave. And the newly one will stretch out his hand over the cave of vipers and they will neither harm nor be harmed on God's perfect earth because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. A picture of perfect creation, a new heaven and earth. And it'll happen at that time when Jesus reigns that the root of Jesse will be magnified as a banner to all people. He will be sought by all peoples. His reign will be glorious. It'll be a new earth where peace reigns. There will be no dangers. There will be no death. We will all live without fear in harmony. It'll be a land where children will be happy. So that's the promise. That's that glorious future that Isaiah is pointing out to us. That Jesus will reign in a kingdom of justice and peace with a new heaven and earth. And so then to conclude this message, as we have heard this morning, Jesus was born to change the world. 
Jesus is the same who was, who is, and who is to come. Since he came to this world, a spiritual revolution has begun. It's not with sword or an army, but it's with his Holy Spirit that the world will change. So then, let's ask for, the spirit, for a filling of the Spirit for us and for this world. Let's ask for wisdom and intelligence, advice and power from him, knowledge to live in God's will, be submitted to him with fear, not our will, but his. To end. The coming of Jesus promises us a bright and glorious future. May we and the world rejoice in that during this coming Christmas time. Amen. <laughs>